take a method, whenever you want to have a classroom quiet, and you don't want to use your voice, you raise your hand. Sooner or later, the audience gets quiet, they either do it, they either do what you're doing, or they just get quiet on their own and watch. Without me ever say, using my voice to get the room quiet. I've done this with 300 people in the room, and within two minutes, the whole room becomes quiet. It's happened every time. I'm Dr. Luis Faustus, I'm a psychologist, I'm not an engineer. So my doctorate in psychology from the University of Iowa. I currently work as the Associate Vice President for Research at New Mexico State University. Today I'm going to talk to you about budgeting, understanding funding, and budgeting finances. Because I want to make sure that when you graduate from college, you are not in debt into the afterlife. <laughs> I know people that have bought cars that are still trying to pay for when the car is eight years old. And they're still paying. So by the time you pay off the car, guess what it's worth? If you're lucky, if you're lucky, one-tenth of what you bought it for, if you're lucky. But your education, whether it be graduate or undergraduate, when you pay for that, guess what? It lasts for the rest of your life. So you can't make a better investment than in your education. And that's what I'm talking about. Being able to invest in your education and make sure you're successful and make sure that when you graduate, you don't have to mortgage off your house, you don't have to go bankrupt, you can actually live a comfortable life and yet be able to afford to put food on the table. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? I have friends of mine that had to declare bankruptcy because they borrowed too much in college. I'm going to show you how to avoid that. So are you ready to go on this trip with me? Yes. Sir? Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going to learn about, present, uh, I'm going to present you some funding sources, budgeting basics, strategies for maintaining and increasing funding opportunities. So this is what you're going to learn. You will know what funding sources are available. Students will have a strategy for managing their funds. How many of you are very good managers? How many of you have never gone wrong on your on your account, on, on your checks? How many of you even use checks anymore? How many of you have gone overdrawn through your phone because you keep using your phone as a, okay, you have overdrawn, got two or three in here, okay. How many of you are always broke? <laughs> All your hands should have gone, no, I'm broke. <laughs> Very good, okay. I'm gonna to try to help you not to get there. And you will know how to work as faculty to support research. Okay. Why it's important? You want to reduce your student your student loan debt. The ratio should be very, very low. You, you should have a higher loan that's worth more than all your degrees put together in such a way. I know people that are in debt for over one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars. Guess who don't the people who usually don't pay their loans back? Guess who's most uh, deficient in pain? You never get lawyers and medical doctors. And they're the ones that make the most. Those of you in the poor and, and the more and the less giving fields of money, always trying to pay your loans. But not in the other two fields. Isn't that best thing? Limited ability to get loans. Now loans are made, are becoming more and more scarce on how to get your loans. Unless you're gonna go to private loans. They'll give it to you. Sometimes they're going anywhere from 10% all the way up to 27%. How many of you have credit cards? Your average credit card at your age level is about 27% for, for your interest rate. So when you borrow like $1,000, you're paying $27 on the compound interest. You know what that means? That if you borrow $1,000, you use your car for $1,000, and you're making a minimum payment of $15 a month. Guess how long it takes you to pay off that $1,000? Because the interest is about 27%, it's going to take you close to three years. And that's if you never put anything else on that card. Can you imagine? For a thousand dollars. Funding is prestigious, it looks good. Funding with your grants and scholarship, that looks good. Because when I look at your resume and you're coming in, I go, wow, research grant. Wow, scholarship. And this student has something. People invested in them. People thought they had the potential to do what they need to do, and they funded them. Connection to faculty. You get to work with faculty on different research projects, you get funded, and you get that paycheck each month, and you realize, wow, I can go to McDonald's. I'm just kidding, man, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm a Popeye's man myself. You know, I have churches and, and KFC, those are my favorites. So, and I have to watch myself with my age, because that, that accumulates quickly. Connection to faculty advising and project engagement. You get to work on projects. So some of the students here at UNL 
have been able during the summer to go like to places like Italy and Spain to work on bridges and do stuff like that. Can you imagine? Would your parents have ever gone to some of those places? How many of you have parents that travel all over the world? Wow, just like mine. Mine didn't go anywhere either. Okay. <laughs> so let me show you what the debt looks like. Are you ready? In 2004, 90% of the students, and this is a, uh, the graduate student debt review, in general, at the 90th percentile, you know what that means? 10% of the students had an average debt in 2004, only 10% of them, of $118,442. This was in 2004. 75th percentile, which means one in four students had a debt of $70,907 by the time they graduated from college, I mean, from graduate school and everything together. And the median, which means about the middle, about almost $40,209 that they owe. This is 2004. So let's jump up to 2012. 90th percentile, which means one out of every 10 students had a debt of about $153,000. For some of us, our parents' houses cost less than that. One in four students had an average uh, loan uh, overall debt of $99,614. That's 2012. And the median, about the middle, $57,600. So as you can see, it went up almost ten dollars to $15,000. And for some reason, in 2008, the debt went down. Why? Why do you think it went down? Because of the uh, economic crash? Yes, we had the economic crash. Nobody wanted to lend money. Nobody wanted to do anything. And we're trying to figure out how to pay off our bills. A lot of people had to foreclose on their homes. It was the best time for buyers if you had money. The worst time for sellers because nobody had money to buy. So if you had some money, you could get amazing deals on houses, cars, and everything back then. So student loan disbursement. Let's take a look here. Graduate plus loan. About 7% of the students get graduate plus loan. That's for graduate school. You know what that is? Graduate plus is when you're able to borrow from the feds, okay, but your interest begins to accrue. Like the day that you get the loan, your interest accrues. And it gets added on to your loan. So by the time you graduate, six months after you graduate, you have to start paying back the loan. And you have to start paying back interest and everything else goes with it. Undergraduate subsidized Stafford loans. Stafford loans? Stafford loans are, are from the government, okay? And when they say subsidized, that means that the government will pay your interest while you're still in school, either half-time or full-time. That's what subsidized means. They're, still, they're gonna pay your interest for you. However, as soon as you graduate, or if your grade point drops, you get kicked out of school, or you decide to quit, within six months of that time, you decide to quit or drop out, or don't make the grades, you have to start paying back the loan. Then, you, then whatever interest starts at that point, you start paying the interest with the loan. That's a Stafford loan. Okay, there is the undergraduate Stafford. That's, uh, there's two subsidized, uh, graduate Stafford, the same thing. As long as you're in school and you go half time or more, guess what? You don't have to pay back the loan until after you graduate. The good things about some of these loans, that those loans is that, and, and in some instances, you're able to work in poor areas, like for instance, if I was gonna be a psychologist in a poor area, or a teacher in a poor area, medical doctor in a poor area, an engineer, working in an impoverished area, something. The first year, they'll pay like 15%, the first year, the second year, 15%, the third year, uh, the third year is uh, 20%, and uh, the fourth year, 20, and the fifth year, almost uh, 30%, which means that you'll have 50% of your loan gets paid off by working in impoverished areas. Of course, you're gonna make a lot less money with your degree in those areas, but half of your loan get paid off by the government for you if you work in those areas. And then you got Parent Plus. I always tell parents, don't do that. You know what Parent Plus means? Your mom and dad are gonna co-sign for you. And guess what happens when they take out the loan? As soon as they take out the loan, your parents have to start making payments on it while you're still at school. They still, they have to start making payments on it to pay the interest right away. What do you think? How many of you have such wonderful parents that they're gonna pay your loan? One. <laughs> It's not that your parents aren't wonderful the rest of you. They may not be able to afford it, okay? Overall debt by a million. By the way, this year alone, for the first time in the United States, we have gone over $1 trillion total in student loan debts across this country. One trillion. 
Can you imagine? So, private loans, okay. About one, uh, uh, about $1.1 billion. By the way, and the private loans, are those that you take on your own for your bank, and guess what, as soon as you take it out, what happens? You gotta start paying it back. You gotta start paying it back. The banks are gonna say, well, we're gonna wait till you graduate in four or five years, and then, and then we'll check you out and see how you're doing. Not on the private loans. They'll come after you. Then you get to a bill collector, and the bill collector starts calling you. So you change the number, and somehow they always find you. you know? <laughs> And, and then they show up at your house, and they can't find you at your house. And then they show up at your parents' house. They can't find you there, so they go to your brother's sister's house. But they don't quit. They keep looking for you. State institution loans, you know. Uh, these are the loans that are within house, about a quarter percent. Other federal loans, 0.09. Federal grad plus. Grad plus loans are, you're paying the interest, okay, because the interest starts the day you take out the loan. You have to pay the interest while you're still in graduate school on the grad plus loans. <laughs> the uh, federal un, uh, unsubsidized Stafford loans, those federal loans, again, you know what unsubsidized means? The government's not gonna pay your interest. I mean, you have to pay the interest because the government will not pay your interest. So you're, you're paying the interest from the very beginning. Subsidized means that the government will pay your interest rate from the beginning until you either graduate or six months after graduation or you drop out or whatever, okay? Federal Perkins loans, same thing, but that, that program got cut in 2008. There's still some residual left, so they're still honoring some of that. This, in that loan, in the Perkins loan, it was a guy from Kentucky, a senator from Kentucky, that's what the loan, uh, the loan got named after. In that loan, if you go back and work in the rural areas, the poor areas, you can get up to 50% of your loans paid off by the government by serving those that have the most need, the most needs, like for instance, if you're a nurse, a doctor, engineers in some in, in some of the areas, so that's what the Perkins is. Percentage of graduate students with loans by level of race and ethnicity. The white students, they average at the doctoral level, about 38% of them get loans. This was in 2008. 41% um, for master's degrees have loans. Latinos, 41%, a little bit higher than the white population, and 58% at the master's level. African Americans, 62%, at the doctoral level, and 68% at the master's level. Asian, about 19% at the doctoral level, and 35% at the master's level. Why do you think the doctoral levels are less? Mm -hmm. More fun. You know what? Okay, one at a time. Raise your hand. Speak up. Exactly. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, when they usually fund Exactly. They figure out ways to fund you so it can take care of your tuition. That's why it's lower. So, look at my graduate debt burden for masters of graduates. And the number I like to look at is no graduate debt. So I take a look at universities when I see. Every university has this circle. And, you can, and many times you can find this on the website. You say, okay, how many of these students don't have any debt for masters? You say 42%. Not too bad, huh? But, here we go. 80,000 or more in debt, 2%. All right, what does that tell you? The probability that 98% of you that go to that university will probably not have a debt. 98% of you will not have a debt of 80,000 or more. Does that make sense? Okay. The same thing goes to less than 20,000. Only 21%. So what does that tell you? 79% of you probably will not have more than $21,000. Isn't that great? Can you imagine? How much does a car cost you now, the average car? They say, you're engineers, how much? 25 to 30,000. How long do you have to pay it off? Five years. How long before it falls apart? <laughs> okay, let's say you bought a sock. Let's do a sock. How long do you think it'll last? Your engineers, come on. Man, quit qualifying all the answers, okay. On the average, by the time you pay off your car on the fifth year, if you don't get an extended warranty on it, by the seventh year, guess what? You start making repairs. You start making repairs. By the time it reaches 70 to 80,000 miles, you're talking tranny and other things like that. Unless you keep up with super maintenance, and even then. And you pay off that $30,000 in five years. And many of you will come to come and say, how much do I have to borrow 10000 I'll forget that. That's way too much money. 
for my long-term life education that I get to keep for the rest of my life and never have to trade it in. And the only time it's going to get old is when I wish and I stop reading and educating myself. What do you think? Is that car worth it? Some of you will sign a contract, like I stated before, into the afterlife. You'll buy a brand new car and, you, and you'll say, $1.99 a month. You can't beat, and you go in there and sign the papers, you know, $1.99 a month for 10 years. At that time, your car is a piece of junk. But you got a good deal, didn't you? Look at the doctor level, 45% on average. Now, let's look at the doctor level, 2009, 2010, 52.3% had no debt. The universities that they attended took care of them. They needed them to do research. They needed them to help the faculty. They needed them to help teach students. So 52%. That means that your chances of having no debt at all is about 48%. Is that great or what? Now look at that, 10,000 or less. 9.5%. That means that that more than, that what is it, 80, about 80 and a half percent there? No, 81 and a half percent of you will not have more than $10,000 or less than that for doctoral degrees. What do you think? Worth it? Worth it? Yes? Okay. All right, cool. Okay, what are some types of funding? Okay, this is where you got to pay close attention. There's research and training grants, scholarships, fellowships, teaching assistantships, and research assistantships. I'm going to go for each one. Grants. Anytime you see the word grant, what does that mean? Free. Uh, huh? Free. I do not. It's never free. They want, you, they want you to do something. They want you to graduate. You don't have to pay back. You what? GPA you do pay me, she said? No, GPA payments. Yeah, okay. Exactly. What do they want you to do? GPA, what else? Uh, you don't pay it back. You don't pay it back. What else? But what's the catch, though, if you don't pay it back? GPA is one. You got to maintain a good grade point. What else? You <laughs> got to have enough credit hours. It's usually full time. Undergraduates full time is about twelve hours, and for graduates about nine hours or more, depending on what university you go to. What else? You must stay enrolled each semester at full time status. You skip a semester, you lose your grant. What else? GPA, must stay enrolled, must be full time. Anything else? Oh, is it um, major hmm? Based on your background. You must take the courses required within your major. Some of you decide, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch and, and take some basket weaving one year because I want to get my GPA up. And they only allow you so many hours per year and you have to finish those hours. And by the fourth year, if you're not done, you don't get the grant anymore. But if you skip out a semester, you lose the grant, you have to start all over. So I mean, all these different things. So money's never free. There's always a catch. You have to find out what the catch is, okay? Students may receive grants from the government or from private sources. Uh, I once received one from the Ford Foundation, the Spanish scholarship grant. They gave me $2,000, that's pretty cool. My other friends that got it went and bought a car. I put it in the bank. Six months later, they were starving. I was not. So that was a good thing. <laughs> they may require students to maintain a specific GPA. I already said that. In graduate school, grants can be used towards travel, research, experiments, or projects. The first time I went to a conference, <coughs> we were broke. Paul Holt and I, my doctoral uh, colleague, we went to Washington, D.C. for a conference. And he had no pickup truck. It was a Toyota. He had a little camper in the back. It wasn't really a camper. It was just a shop. So we went to the American Science Association convention that had about 10, 15,000 people. We went, and we didn't get a hotel, we couldn't afford it. So we parked in the parking garage, it was $15 a day. So we had two big sleeping bags inside the back. So what we did was, we parked in the parking lot, we had curtains on the back of the truck, and we slept in there. So when it came time, the YMCA was about three blocks away. So in the morning, you know, we took our dress clothes, we go to the YMCA, we shower and everything for free put on our clothes, and we go and snuck into the sessions at the American Science Association Convention, and we went to all the sessions, and we went to all, almost every reception has food, and we were starving, so we went and we ate the food and so forth. You're keeping this, aren't you? I should be saying about this. Okay, but that's how I went to my first conference. All, all the other students in the program had, had, had money to go, they had support, 
for me to parents and old whatever. We didn't have anything. That's how you have to go to my press conference. And nobody knew. <laughs> what well, you do now. But anyway, nobody knew then what we did. But we got to, that's how we went to my first conference. And I got to sit on all the sessions and meet all the people. Back then, and they never checked you. Now they have these badges and everything, and they scan you when you go in. Because I guess too many of us kept doing that. <laughs> okay. Scholarships. Do you pay scholarships back? No. No, you get to keep that money. However, they're giving the students based on academic excellence or talent. What does that mean? You have to do what? Keep the GPA up. You got to attend your classes. You can't drop out a semester. You got to maintain full-time status. Almost the same thing as a grant, right? Scholarships vary in their amounts. Some, some people get, I've seen like the, the people who get the Gates Millennium Scholarship, you know how much that pays? Up to 30,000 a year from bachelor's all the way through what? Doctor. They pay for the whole thing as long as you stay in school consecutive. They pay your education from bachelor's all the way to a doctorate degree, the Gates Millennium Scholarship. I know, it's like, by the way, I never got any of these. These things are just mouses. I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit older than you are. Um, scholarships vary their amount. Okay, like, like, like a grant, you've got to maintain your grades, can be awarded through your school or, or private resources. Fellowships, there are generally three types. Recruitment. Most universities have recruitment fellowships. But they're usually good for about a year. But you've got to remember that, because what happens at the end of the year? you what? No. If you only get a scholarship for one year, what does that tell you? You only get funded for one year. Yep, so it's over. You've got to figure out where the rest of the funding is coming. So you have to prepare for those things if you get a one-year recruitment scholarship. They say, we want you, want you so bad, we're going to pay for your first year of college. And we're going to take care of you. End of the first year. There's no more fun. Well, yeah, you know, we're only willing to promise one year, but you're already here. You're already here. So you have to make arrangements during that first year to make sure you cover yourself. Okay? Uh, special needs. This could be associated, yeah, special needs scholarships. Uh, what that means is, like, for instance, they may need more nurses, let's say. Okay? So they'd say, we're going to give you a scholarship to go to major in nursing, and we're going to pay for you know two or three years. But it's specific to the major. So as soon as you get out of there, what happens? You lose your scholarship. That's what they're paying you for. And in some scholarships, if you do that, guess what happens? They make you pay it back because you left the major that they were paying you to be in. You say you don't pay scholarships. You don't if you stay and follow the rules of the scholarship. It's a scholarship. It's the reason. Scholarship. Fellowships, fellowships they give you, but you got to stay within the major that you get it in. If that's the kind of fellowship that you get, does that make sense? Okay, if that's the kind you get, for like for instance, for psychology, they were recruiting more and more psychologists, so I could get a fellowship, but I had to stay in psychology. As soon as I got out, guess what happened? I didn't get out, but for those that did, they lost their money. It was over. And sometimes, depending on the rules of the fellowship. Sometimes they make you pay it back if it's for a specific major. Okay. Yes. Faculty Associated Fellowship. That's when a uh, faculty might write a grant or so forth and they have enough to pay for a fellowship for one year. And they'll go recruit you and then guess what? You get to work with them but you stay with them. But what happens if you leave that faculty? You lose your money. All these different things. So there's a catch to everything. You have to make sure that you know what you're doing, how you're doing it, and the decisions that you make. Okay, the uh, fellowships are granted to graduate and postgraduate students, awarded by private organizations, institutions, and the government, given a one to four year stipend with or without a tuition waiver. Sometimes fellowships don't pay you tuition. Sometimes they do. These are questions you gotta ask. Because when you get in a letter, you have just received a fellowship. Doesn't make you feel good? What's the first thing you do? You show your parents time. Look what I got. And then you arrive and you realize you have to pay $10,000 uh, in, in tuition that's not included in your fellowship. You've got to ask those questions up front. Okay. Based on merit, need, and institution faculty grant awarded by schools to students who have been recommended by a faculty member. For most fellowships, you're going to need your reference letters. You're going to need your resume. You're going to need uh, to show your own, your own experiences, how, how they relate to what it is you're applying to. You're to what's the first thing you do when you are you interested in working for a faculty and they have a fellowship? What's the first thing you do? Suck up. Did you say suck up? 
Uh, I probably wouldn't use that word, but um, <laughs> what you want to do though is go on their website, take a look at what that faculty's experience is, find out what their interests are. And so when you write your letters, guess what? Dear Dr. John Hill, I see that you and I have similar interests. I've always been enamored and very excited to study, whether in the area of civil engineering, in the area of whatever the research is. I also see that you have the same, the same types of grants and research directly related with that area. I would very much like to work with you. My ambition and my motivation is very high. I would like you to consider me for that fellowship. Wow. You know what you should have been doing, right? I mean, it sounds good when you get that one down. Um, yeah, cool word, I use that one too. So, you make it sound good because, guess what, when faculty get letters like that, we think, wow, and you're right, we think, oh man, this person really, you know, kind of kissing up a little bit. But guess what, we're thinking, they took the time to read the website, they took the time to look at the work I was doing, they took the time to look at the details within that work, and they took the time to say something about how integrated with where their interests were and where they might want to go. Cool, huh? I used to do workshops on how to write resumes, how to interview, and how to dress for success. And I always had students who go, why are we going to do that? And they go, do you want a job or don't you? Do you want a fellowship or don't you? These are the kind of things that you get. Teaching assistantship, this is called, I was a TA. Okay, offers students the opportunity to learn how to teach and develop excellent understanding. I love teaching. I love getting up and seeing if I can inspire your minds. And if I can, I figure, okay, what did I do wrong? I gotta change it. Teaching assistants, so sometimes you get to help the faculty create papers. Sometimes you actually get to teach a class. Sometimes you get to tutor with students. Sometimes you get to oversee labs. You get to do a lot of cool stuff. And it makes you feel what? When you have all these undergraduates in front of you and you're up there teaching. What's that make you feel like? Maybe the question I should ask, how many of you like to teach? Okay, you got five of you, so only five. Okay, what the rest of you want to do if you get offered a teacher assistant? Sir? Are you going to say, By the way, most teaching assistantships and graduate assistantships at the graduate school level usually have a tuition waiver, or they pay the tuition, or at least you get in-state tuition. So <laughs> can you imagine if you go and a professor goes, I have a great opportunity to be a teaching assistant. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Because yes. what if you try it and you love it? And what if you try it and you're miserable? And you know, okay, I'm not going to be a professor. But what if you try it and you love it and you think, wow, this is not bad. Okay, that's okay. You can get anywhere from 7500 to 20000 7500 is usually working for 10 hours a week for two semesters, it's about 7500 and then 20 grand if you're working 20 hours a week across nine, nine months. You gain experience in and out of the classroom, you get to work with faculty members, and you get to learn how to do a lesson plan, you get to learn how to teach, you get to learn how to do concepts, theories, all that kind of stuff. And many times you get a chance to actually work with a professor so you can get a publication. And guess what? What happens when you get your first publication? What do you do with it? Frame it. Show it to your mom. <laughs> show it to your mom. Some of us framed it, but some of us like to share with everybody else too. Yes, you say, look, I got published, man. Because when you get published, guess what? Last forever. Right? And our article is going to be there forever. You're going to be 80 years old and show, you, show your grandchildren. Let me show you. I'm going to publish. See, because it's always going to be there. It's always going to be there. Okay? Duties. Teaching assistants, okay, running lab sessions, grading undergraduate papers. I already talked about that. You hold regular office hours like a faculty, and students get to come in and see you. And you get to tell them, you did excellent. You also get to tell them, I don't think you're going to pass this class. So, <laughs> so that's part of the responsibility. It's part of the responsibility because you're helping a professor. Hopefully you can tell them, you know, with a little bit of help, I think I can get you up to the grade you want to be in. Hopefully. Okay? Conducting study and review sessions. These are cool. Study sessions. I used to conduct psychology lab and I go in and teach them how to I, I would teach the students mnemonics, I would teach them how to memorize stuff so they can remember forever. I, I used to teach them how to sing songs to, to the answers. You wouldn't believe the stuff I used to do to make sure the students could pass the test. Okay, why become a research assistant? Why? Because you're actually going to learn to do research. What is research? 
being able to answer a question that hasn't been hasn't been dealt with yet, being able to study it, being able to analyze it, and guess what? Maybe coming up with something that's going to better the livelihood of everybody around you. What if you're here might be able to develop the greatest transportation stoplight that's going to force people to stop where they're supposed to and not run red lights and keep people safe on the road. We had turnabouts. We finally put in a turnabouts in New Mexico. You know those driving circles for the cars, right? You know what they have in Europe? Yeah, we still don't get it. I've seen people hit more people on that thing. Yeah, people don't understand. No, they don't. They don't exactly. They, don't they, they keep driving around and thinking, oh, man, i got to get to the outside. How do I do well, this? You're supposed to yield. Right? Exactly. You're supposed to yield. And you know what that means? You're supposed to be nice when you drive. That's what that means. You don't scream at people. Okay, but that's what those roundabouts are about. So now we're having more crashes to report because our people don't understand it. So either we've got to educate or do something, okay? Then we used to have what? We thought that we could stop people from running red lights or forget what, put what up on the poles. Cameras. Well, the, our city went over $3 million in debt and they're still trying to collect. It's been five years, so they took the cameras off, said forget it, we can't collect. <laughs> yep, so something's working, something's do not. How do you get involved as a research assistant? You, you visit the faculties uh, on the website, and then you take a look at what they're interested in. You find out what kind of grants and stuff they have. Then you go visit them and see what opportunities they have, and you ask. Just like they told you over there, you ask. Do you have any research assistantships? Okay. Okay, here we go. Budget basics. How much can you count on? What you get, and only what you get. What are your monthly expenses? So here we go. Take out your sheet. Are you ready? By the way, that website up there, if you, if you click on that website and at home, it'll take you right up to your budget calculator and do it for you. So here we go. First, you have to find out how much, when you apply to the university and they send you your funding letter and they tell you what you're going to get, assistance grants or whatever, this is what you do. First thing you do is you put them all down. Hey, if you got a grad assistantship, how much are you going to get paid? How much are you going to take home? Off-campus job. Hopefully you won't get one of those, but off-campus job don't pay much. Unless you're going to work for a company and you're doing research for them and, and so forth. Family, loans, who's going to help you out? And you total all your funds. You say, okay, this university is going to give me 30000 This university is going to give me twenty five. This university is going to give me fifty. dollars Then what do you do? Take out this sheet. Now listen carefully, this is very important. Listen carefully. Every university website will tell you, private school or public school, how much it costs, the bottom line, to go there. And they will have on that website tuition and fees, room and board, books and supplies, transportation, personal expenses, campus health insurance, resident or non-resident tuition, and they'll have the total down at the bottom. Same thing, public university, tuition per credit hour, technology fee, library fee, everybody's different, but at the bottom they'll say, you get, you need 26,000 to survive there, private school's about 42,000, and that's about average for a private school. So now you know how much you need for each one, right? So this is what you do. Step number two, you put down, huh, uh, the university that you pick, you put down how much housing, Utilities could cost, groceries, transportation, entertainment, and you put it all down. Don't think about how much you're getting. Just put everything down that you know you have to put down. By the way, before I went to graduate school, I, I, I paid off all my credit cards. So I had zero debt in credit cards before I started grad school. I sold my car and bought a car for $1,500. It ran pretty good, but it just got me around. I had a nice car and I sold it because my loan payment was 450 bucks a month just for the car. So, but I, but I was living at home, so I had to. So, put all that down. If you have children, daycare and so forth, anything you think you would spend, you put it down. Step number three, non-monthly expenses. Like for instance, how about your car registration? That's once a year, usually about 40 to 100 bucks, right? It's not 100. Huh? Yeah, it's just 100. It's what? 100. 100, okay, a year, right? For your college tuition. Insurance, healthcare, moving expenses. That's a one-time only, right? 
unless you did like we did, we did out of the back end of a truck. So, you know. Just me and my friend, not my wife and I, just me and my friend and I. My wife would never do that. Okay. Lab research expenses. Professional association. When you join a professional association, undergrad, uh, graduate, it usually costs about maybe from 50 to 150 bucks a year. Okay, those are yearly. Travel to a conference, when you do it like I did. That's embarrassing, man. No one got caught. Yes, man. It's four or five. Huh? It's four or five. Oh, 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 thank you. Vacations. You students, you don't take vacations. <laughs> Almost there. Okay, so now what you do is you there. Okay, you take your total funding, and that's what the university has offered you, right? Total monthly expenses, you put that there. Total non-monthly expenses, and God, you pray, you pray, you say, you hope it comes up to zero. That's what they mean by zero-based budget. That's what they mean. Hopefully it'll come up to zero. If it does not, that means whatever you're missing, you're gonna take out a loan or do some other way to fund yourself. To try to make up that difference. You do not need a car. Let me tell you to go this quickly. You gotta save, you gotta save. When I had my graduate assistantship, I realized that I, I could live on half that money. So I was taxing it at half weight. Because the following year, I might not get a, a graduate assistantship, and then what? Or I might not have the money I needed. So this is what you do to, to save budget from your assistantship, put 10% of your funding into a savings account. Understand your tax situation most. Now we have earned income credit, so as students you probably qualify for that, you get an extra maybe 15 hours a year back or something, because you're, you're not paying much in. Don't do investments. Investments means if you get a CD or something like that, guess what? You can't take the money out for three to five years because you have to let it mature. Uh, savings is probably the only way to go. Long-term investment, you don't have enough to do long-term investment. And most investors come and say, how much you want to invest? $100 a month? To do what? So, no. Common mistakes, no savings for emergencies. You invest and lose all your money because you get a risk of being like, like you buy stocks. We have another stock crash and guess what? You're back down to zero. Not knowing the difference between funding resources. Change it or not change the advisor. You change an advisor that's funding you, you think the advisor's gonna keep paying you for work to work with somebody else? No. It's like the mafia, you broke the family rule. So you, get, you don't get nothing, you don't get nothing. Conclusion, weigh the benefits. With previous two students, we'll need a link to research factory. Stack your funding. I want to acknowledge Alfred Sloan, Minority Graduate Fellowship, and Dr. Eric Jones. I have to give you the evaluation. Did you learn something from this? What did you learn? <laughs> wow, okay. But what you need to do, okay, so these are evaluation forms. So you got to you take one, take one each, and then, and then you'll collect them. By the way, remember, every university website will tell you exactly how much it's going to cost to go there. So put down what you're going to get, compare it to what you need, subtract the difference, and that's when you know what you might have to do for loans and so Got it? Yeah. And go to the best deal. It might not be the university that you, that you want to be at. And for me, this is my advice. Most people say, pick the one you really want to be at for good fit. That's true. But if the good fit wants, I'm going to give you anything. You might want to find another good fit. You take one, you pass around, and give me the rest of the Questions?